Ben, thank you very much. <coughs> Sorry about the cough, it's the tail end of it, will be gone by the end of the day. Um, okay, yeah, I'm Rodney, you must have gathered by now, if you don't know me, I'm in Worthing. Still an elder, <coughs> now in Worthing. Um, been in Worthing 25, 26 probably years, maybe even slightly longer. So, it's great to be here, lovely to be with you. Uh, when I was uh, in Hull recently at the Hub, um, I was just about to get up to speak, and my iPad uh, decided it was time to suddenly update. <coughs> so suddenly the screen was like frozen. I thought I'm going to kick that one. <laughs> the screen was frozen for um, quite a while, so luckily Steve Whittington improvised. <laughs> we pray for a church impromptu. Anyway, so praise God for no Wi Fi. Um, okay, so today I'm speaking about anointed preaching. It suddenly feels very, um, I don't know, an awesome topic to speak about, to be honest with you. What I want you to do is I don't want you to make any notes. I, I, no, 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 don't put the stuff away though. <laughs> I just want you to write down what God says to you. Wow. Write down what He promises you. Write down where He challenges you. Write down what He's correcting in you. Okay, but don't make notes. Um, I think we, we, we're, too, we're too used to preaching to the notepad. I'm preaching to change your life. So we really stand for a moment. I think you sat down. <laughs> just hold out your hands. I just want to pray over you, and um, then I want you to pray. No, but I want you to pray a prayer first, and then I'll pray over you. I just want you to pray where you are now, saying, "God, I want my life changed today. Yeah. I don't want to come back to wherever my setting is the same." Can you just pray that now for yourself? Yeah, Lord, we just come before you now. We are before the throne of God. And that beautiful hymn took us there. And Lord, we come before the throne and we find one of such beauty and magnificence, such glory, such tenderness, and yet such holiness. And so pure. And so unlike us. And yet one who wants to make us like him. We're, 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 in a way, we're dumbstruck by that. But Lord, I pray, by your Spirit, speak to us. You've already been speaking. The things you've already been saying, Lord, I pray, they'll be in the notepads. And I pray, Lord, they'll go and bear fruit in the coming weeks and months and years. And I pray even what you might say in the next 45 minutes. More stuff that will change our lives. But we don't want to be the same. We come to be changed and challenged. Encouraged in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can sit down. <clears throat> so, um, so my wife Sue, she's not here today, but Sue and I, we were in Edinburgh recently. <laughs> I bring my beautiful fans, where do I go now? <laughs> my family, my beautiful family, and um, we were there recently, and we we're walking in the Royal Mile. And if you know Edinburgh, it's the famous road going up, depends if you're going down, if you're going, you're going up to the castle. <laughs> it's where the really touristy bit, um, where you hear the bagpipes playing and all of that. And um, so we're walking along there, in the tourist <coughs> moment. And um, then what we did is we heard somebody preaching the gospel in the street. Yeah, you think that. I don't know what you think when you suddenly hear somebody preaching the gospel. Sometimes you might think like, okay, we're going over this way now. <laughs> Good luck to you. Or you walk past it, you go, oh, I'm a Christian, it's all right, I don't need that. Uh, or, I don't know, maybe, maybe you engage them. Oh, well done, great for you, preaching the gospel, we encourage you. I don't know what your reaction is. Um, as I listened to what the man was saying, there was nothing wrong with what he's saying. He was preaching the gospel. It was good stuff. Nothing wrong with it at all. But you know what? There was something wrong, though. They were not engaging the masses of people that were walking by. There was no crowd gathered around them. Everybody's just walking past, doing their thing. People crowding around the bagpipe, just giving them money. Or the other 
street artists, there were a few around, but the man preaching the gospel, everybody just walking by, they're not, you know. Maybe there was somebody a long way away, just curiously out of sight, because no, I don't want to identify, but there was nothing. I, I didn't observe it anyway, let me put it like that. So years ago, I used to preach on the streets myself when I was in the church in Eastbourne. I know how hard that is. I know how difficult that is. I know how soul-destroying it can almost be. Probably the wrong word to use, isn't it? Encourage you, you know, preaching the streets, pretty soul-destroying for you. You know, <coughs> uh, be good for your soul. <coughs> um, I know that's like. I really do. I was with Lex Nazoides. He was in the church. Some of you may know the name. <coughs> um, one of the bigger, bigger, one of the most, sorry, one of the more uh, well-known evangelists in New Frontiers. Um, and he taught me how to preach in the streets. But you know what? However often I did it, however creative our presentation was, you know, and I would do the old um, <coughs> sketchboarding and all that and all the kind of salesman's pitch, I would get a bit of a crowd, get a bit of a laugh. <coughs> um, very few people stopped. Even fewer people showed genuine interest. In fact, we were on the streets in Eastbourne for seven years. We were preaching in the streets for seven years. We saw one person saved. Now, you may say, well, it's worth it for the one. And in one sense, yes, it is definitely worth it for the one. <coughs> but one person in seven years, it's, it's actually quite tough, isn't it? It's really tough. And, 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 and the danger is that we kind of like, we, in, that, in those moments, we try and use gimmicks to, 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 to draw a crowd. But actually, gimmicks can draw a crowd, but gimmicks won't convict a crowd. <coughs> And here's a question. Why, why is it? Why, why do people pass by the Royal Mile when somebody's preaching the gospel? Is it their fault? Interesting question to ask. Is it their fault? They're the ones who are, you know, not listening to the word of God. You know, they're the ones walking to hell. You can take that view. It's their fault. I'm preaching the word. I'm doing what I'm called to do. Some people with preaching to that, that's the view they take. And the word's just going to go out like a fait accompli. Like a, like, a, like a Noah preaching, there's a flood coming. But, you know, nobody's coming to the ark. Why do people not listen? <clears throat> Is our generation more disinterested or more ungodly than former generations? What's your answer to that? Some people would say, yeah, okay, more and more ungodly. I don't know, I read some pretty awful stuff in history, as well as some pretty awful stuff now. Okay, so, uh, let me give you a quote to challenge you. This is from the Scottish evangelist Duncan Campbell. He said this, Preaching truth without the anointing of the Holy Ghost is helping the devil to damn souls. There is nothing on earth today so deadening as preaching without heaven's anointing. Refrain from preaching! Unless you know that the dew of heaven is on your soul. What a quote. I read it on the train on the way back from Edinburgh last week. I thought, I've got to get that one in. <laughs> what a quote. Um, Duncan Campbell was involved in the Hebridean revival in the early 1950s. I think it's probably my most, the revival I like reading about most. There's probably more writings about other revivals, but I just love reading about the stories that happened. Amazing. And in the 20th century, middle of the 20th century. <clears throat> but he discovered, Duncan Campbell discovered the difference between preaching and preaching with God's anointing. That's what he's talking about. This is going to be challenging. Some of this is going to be challenging. Okay? Uh, what's the point in having a prophet? You know, you're challenged. Okay? <laughs> what is the point? You know? Uh, I can go and say peace, peace when there is no peace. But you know, <clears throat> um, so it may feel a bit, a bit challenging. I honestly, I'm as challenged as you are as I'm. Reading, I'm thinking to myself as well. So, his quote is very challenging, but it's what I want to speak on this afternoon. And it's not, I'm not just talking about evangelistic sermons out in the street. <clears throat> That's my example. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about all preaching <clears throat> under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How can the dew of heaven rest on our preaching? And I believe there are some things that we can do to posture ourselves. So there's a little bit that's maybe out of our control, but there's certainly some stuff that we can posture ourselves. <clears throat> so I've got basically got two points and a, 
a lengthy conclusion. Um, not quite as long as Alex's, but do you know what? <laughs> you know, when, when you have children, he's not much half, but when you have children, they, they're, they're an exaggerated version of you. And I'm really the same with spiritual children. So I, I, I consider Alex my spiritual son. Um, and um, he, he does a lot of things that I do, he just exaggerates them a bit. <laughs> okay, okay. Let, let's just let's just stop in. I know. Okay. Remember, we had good times and challenging times, and he said it. Um, so this is the first thing: humility with courage. We talk about posturing ourselves. Humility with courage. Okay. When John the Baptist preached outside, crowds gathered to listen to him. If he preached on the Royal Mile, they were not walking past. They were gathering, and they're publicly repenting. And the religious leaders, they were, they were agitated by this. They're wondering if he was claiming to be the Messiah, or maybe he's claiming to be Elijah. So they sent priests and Levites to investigate. Let's read um, all my, I think, I think pretty much all my, uh, our new living translation. You've probably been told not to use that version, but here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's easily understandable. When the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I'm not a Messiah. Well then, who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? No. Nope. He replied. Are you the prophet we're expecting? No. Nope. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. They're under pressure, aren't they? They're really under pressure. We've got to have an answer. Please tell us something. We're going to say whatever you like. <coughs> they didn't say that. I'm just reading that. Um, poetic license. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, if you want the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptise with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognise, though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave.